We heard David Burglos was doing some amazing tricks in London's nightclubs. Tricks which seemed to have no natural explanation. Tricks in which he seemed to read people's thoughts. Yet he laughs at the term mind reader and says he relies only on psychology, acute observation and memory. We decided to put him to the test. This is a plain account of the way things happened on Wednesday, June 17, when Burglass achieved something never done before by anyone in any country. The editor had asked his assistant editor, a man called Gordon Watkins, to hide an object somewhere in London, but he told him not to even tell him or anyone in the office, and he took that very seriously. He left his home very early in the morning, about 6.30, took his car to the tube station, got out, made sure that he wasn't being followed. He then took a taxi to the, the location and hid the object. And then he returned the same way in the taxi, tube and his car, and he refused to tell anyone where it was hidden until after I left the office. Having accepted the challenge, I turned up at the picture post office in June 1953, and to my surprise, there was quite a gathering. There were about 25, 30 people, mostly VIPs, the celebrities, well-known business a woman, a member of parliament, the editor himself, uh, the assistant editor, and quite a few of their senior staff. I was introduced and then they said, would you explain what you intend to do? I stood up and they provided me with a map of London pinned to a big board. And I said, well, somewhere in this area, in the whole of London, they have hidden an object which is something I've got to try and find. And I also had offered to drive down a route that they would be thinking of after I left the office. It sounds impossible, but that was the challenge. I said, but I'm going to be blindfolded. And since it's important that every one of you realizes that I really can't see. So I brought along a few items. I had thick pads of cotton wool, which we placed over somebody's eye, and they agreed they couldn't see a thing. Then there was a black blindfold. They checked both sides. You couldn't see through it. And then a black sack to go over the top and I said make sure there are no holes around it, just turn it around, twist it inside out and so on. And they checked and everything was fine. I then offered that they could blindfold me with either the cotton wool or the blindfold or the sack or the night or three. And of course they chose all three. So the cotton wool was placed over my eyes, making sure I couldn't see underneath, above at the sides. Then they tied the black blindfold around and when they were really satisfied, they put the black sack over my head, tied it under my neck, and then they wished me luck and I left the office. The funny thing is that they carefully guided me to the lift and downstairs again helped me to get to the car because they thought, well, he can't see. But of course it seems strange that they were helping me so carefully when I was volunteering to try and find a hidden object somewhere in London. Well, now what happened after that is only something I heard about later. The editor said, now if David can do what he claims to be able to do, he's going to try and find the object which was hidden by the assistant editor and he hasn't even told me what it is or where it is. So will you please tell us? And the assistant editor, Gordon Watkins, said, well, actually, I hid it in the middle of Better Sea Park, there's a, 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 some pleasure gardens with a boating pond and a little island and I hid the object by the flagpole uh, in the middle of the boating pond. Well, one or two of the staff said, but he specifically said, don't do anything over water. Well, I'd only said that to make it sound more interesting. There was no particular reason for it. I often throw in a little thing like that just to make it sound more intriguing. But they had gone over water. So I didn't know where we were going when we left the office. And they also had the task of finding a starting point, And they decided on Berkeley Square. And then they drew a line on the map 
from the office in a roundabout way through the West End to Barclay Square and from Barclay Square to Bedford Park, but they're trying to trick me by going all the way down to Chelsea and back again. And what happened in the car was, I would say, turn left or right, and the only time the photographer, the reporter or the driver would speak to me if they couldn't turn left or right because either there was no turning or it was a no entry sign. And eventually, when I said, I think we're on the starting point, I asked them to make a note of the streets. They said, we already have been doing that. They made a note that I said Barclay Square was the starting point. We found out later on that it was. I then directed them down Sloan Street, across Sloan Square, and then onto the bridge. They were reluctant to go any further because they could see the Thames and they remembered that I said not over water. But I got hold of the central mirror, I said I want to go in that direction and they had no choice but to take me across the bridge when I asked them to stop. We got out and I heard the clicking of lots of cameras because they had anticipated if I do turn up that's where I would be. And I made my way through the turnstile and groped my way through all the little stalls. They had souvenir stalls where they were selling straw hats and other bits and pieces. I bumped into people and I kept on going. And suddenly they got hold of me and stopped me because I was on the top of some steep stairs. And if they hadn't stopped me, I would have probably fallen down. But luckily they guided me down the steps. I then continued and once again they grabbed me and I asked them why and said, you can't go any further. I bent down and I felt there was some water. I said, well, I realized there's water here, but I still want to go in that direction. So they called over one of the little pleasure boats and three of us got into it. One of the attendants, uh, Mr. Griffiths, who'd been driving me all that time, and myself. And I steered the boat towards the center of the pond where there was a little island. We clambered down, it was all wet and muddy. I felt my way up to the pole and then I put my hand down, got hold of a piece of wood, thought for a moment, I said, no, that's not it, I threw it away. I put my hand down that hole again and this time I found a canvas bag. I pulled it up, I opened it up and took out a lady's Chinese slipper. And I said, I think this is the object and I held it up. Of course, they took photographs. Of course, they didn't know whether that was the object or not. Anyway, they took the black sack off and checked the blindfold. The cotton wool was still in place and the blindfold, so I couldn't have seen. We were then taken to the manager's office to be cleaned up. They even polished my shoes. They gave me a drink. And then they showed me the pad with a list of streets that we had driven down. It didn't mean anything to me at that moment because I, I wasn't sure that we had gone the right route. Eventually, we drove back to Picture Post Office, and by now it was about 6, 6, 30 in the evening, and they had reassembled most of the group that had been there earlier that day. And I walked into the, the room, saw the crowd, and went up to one lady and said, I think this is your slipper and she confirmed that it was. Picture Post itself was advertising in all the suburban papers. They took large ads, sometimes quarter page ads, to announce the next edition, which would come out on July the 1st, 1953. But I could not believe when I saw it, they mentioned my stunt, saying the five guinea for a logical explanation for the impossible, showing a picture of me with the black uh, hood on and holding the Chinese slipper, and the Everest story. Now the Everest story was the biggest story of that year, because the New Zealander, Edmund Hillary, and his Sherpa, Tanjing, had just climbed Mount Everest on the 29th of May, 1953. It was a new story that everybody throughout the world was talking about, an achievement that had never been done before. And yet, Picture Post thought 
that my story needed to top it. They said, our oh, picture post challenge and the Everest story, probably the best publicity I ever had at that time. Thank you.